Once upon a time, I did a degree in zoology. And that was a long time ago. So since then, a lot of things have changed. Uh, quite a few species have become extinct. Some of the facts that I learned are no longer true. And I don't even work as a zoologist. But um, it, that doesn't matter. I still use a lot of that training almost every day because science isn't just something you know. Science is something you do. And it's a culture which has got practical and ethical rules which have evolved over time. And there's three of those rules that I'd like to focus on today. The first is that scientists have to engage in fair peer review. Secondly, scientists must state their purpose as clearly and as honestly as possible. And finally, you have to acknowledge uncertainty. So why would these rules matter if you're not a scientist? Well, because science is not just for scientists. Any one of us now, there are many, many opportunities where we can record our observations and our interpretations of the world around us. We can play a serious game, or we can get more deeply involved to find out about a domain like insect ecology or astronomy. We can join a community like OpenStreetMap, and we can systematically build a picture of the world around us and our surroundings. Or we can use our personal knowledge of language and local geography to translate text and help with a disaster response. And there are fantastic initiatives towards opening up data, making scientific publications more accessible, and generating genuinely reproducible research where people share not just their results, but the data and the models that they use to get there. And as this wealth of data becomes available, it enables us to start asking our own questions. This isn't just us feeding data to scientists. We can take this if it's open, and we can ask our own questions with it. There are also some great tools for displaying those results. So we have um, online tools in particular, which will allow you to generate engaging and exciting visualizations, particularly maps, almost as soon as the data becomes available. So there are lots of terms for this huge wave, this explosion of participation. But the one I really like is citizen science. And that's because I believe that to be a citizen requires us to be scientific, or at least to try to be scientific, to engage with evidence in a critical way and to actually build knowledge. So every good scientist, and therefore by my reasoning every good citizen, understands the value of randomization and controlled trials. But in the field where I work, in my research field is geospatial science, geospatial analysis, which has some overlaps with the hydrologist that Max was talking about. Uh, it's very difficult to run a controlled experiment. So in a conservation planning context, you have a complicated system with many, many interactions. It's got huge uncertainties. And you've got to try and predict the outcome of a strategy or an intervention, but you only get one try. So you've got to use a model. And to feed those models, to build them, to calibrate them, to validate them, you need data. You need lots of it. And it needs to be as good as possible. So obviously, this is where this new sea of volunteered information collected by people all over the world could potentially have a massive impact. It could actually help us to make better decisions. Um, and, and more evidence-based decisions. But there's a big question in my research area, which is taxing a lot of very bright people at the moment, is whether or not this data is actually any good. This is a big field of research. So to take the example of weather, to mention the Met Office again as well, they're getting a few plugs here, um, this map on the left is the authoritative official network of weather stations run by the Met Office. But the maps in the middle and on the right show amateur weather stations in people's gardens which are contributing data to two different online networks. And you can see the difference in spatial arrangement. You can see that there are gaps there. So that's one question is, how do we interpret these gaps? In the case of weather, it's easy because just because there's no weather station at a location, it doesn't mean there's no weather there. But in other contexts, it's trickier. So say we want to take some geotag photos from Flickr, and we want to map a species distribution using them. What does it mean when we have no photo? Does it mean that there was no visitor? Or does it mean that the species is absent there? So absence of evidence in that case is not evidence of absence. Um, the, another characteristic of this kind of 
volunteered information is its variability. So you can take a whole set of weather stations that are on the market today, very similar to these ones being used by the amateurs volunteering data, and put them in almost exactly the same location, and you will still get quite different readings. And pulling apart this variation is really quite tough because you want to divide the information, what is interesting and salient, and maybe tells you about a microclimate, from the error which might come from miscalibration or even somebody doing this maliciously. And pulling that apart takes a lot of work. You have to look at other environmental variables, and you actually uh, have to do some machine learning if you want to automate it. So I'm glad that Max introduced that term. And if you do want to do that, by the way, I recommend these two guys, Simon Bell and Dan Cornford. So that data in its raw state is not fit to go straight into a meteorological model. But it is perfectly fit for another purpose because the map on the left is a systematic sampling design. It's an attempt to get as representative of pos as possible a layout uh, of samples which will cover the whole of the UK. But the maps in the middle and on the right tell us where the weather nerds live. So if we combine these locations with some social demographic information, we can find out what kinds of places weather nerds live. Uh, and I hope that they're all here today, actually. Um, so assessing fitness for purpose in that way is something that we all do. We do it not just when we look at data, but also when we look at interpretations of data. So when we look at charts, graphs, newspaper articles, and maps as well. And in our lives in general, we're often quite canny consumers. So if I have to buy a car or book a hotel room, I'll go and check out loads of reviews. I'll mine that text for interesting terms using my neural network. And I will even have a look at the trustworthiness of the reviewers. But when it comes to data, if I see a free data set, I'm sometimes so grateful and so excited that I forget to, do, to be so picky. And I start asking, Am I fit for the data's purpose? What can the data do with me? Rather than being a little bit more critical. So to try and counter that, we've, uh, review, we've brought this reviewing process into my field of research to allow people to actually feedback users and experts to feedback on what they've done with data, what kinds of analysis they did in what domain. Did they come up against a problem in a particular spatial region? Uh, did they come up with a solution to that problem? And would they recommend an alternative data set? And they can comment in this way, not just on data sets, but also on models, because we all know that models often need an independent eye casting over them. So there are all these advantages to opening up data and models. But there are still some obstacles. And sometimes that's because uh, prestige or um, publications or income depend on these outputs. Sometimes it's because information genuinely has a good reason for staying confidential. But still there's a lingering worry among a lot of people that somebody might blunder in, whether it's malign or well-meaning, they'll come along and they'll do something misleading with the data and they'll do something wrong and inappropriate with the data. So we really need to think how much we need to worry about this. Is it a serious problem? I'm going to show you a wrong map. And it's not one that I generated, so I have done some terrible things with data in the past, but I'm too embarrassed to talk about them in front of a camera. So I've swapped data crimes with someone else, and I'm going to show you this one. So this map was presented to me as evidence that... Um, I can't see the screen. As evidence that um, only 12% of diabetes patients in the South Birmingham Primary Care Trust have been picked up by GPs. So that's a really serious figure, and this is a serious problem. It's estimated that there are about a million people, over a million people in the UK, not being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. And we have various kind of instincts that we can use when we assess a picture or a map. Uh, we can perhaps uh, look at some subtle cues in the image, which might give us an idea as to its authenticity. So you can tell from this one that if you're very observant, you might realise I didn't actually go to my graduation ceremony. But I didn't, I didn't have a graduation ceremony as bad as justices, though. <laughs> but, you know, I didn't go. <laughs> um, but at the same time, we, just, we often fall into perceptual traps. So we do have to be careful because randomness to us doesn't always look random, especially when it's a bit smoothed. Our eye tends to kind of catch on the aberrations in the data and we think that they're patterns. So going to the figures, before we, before we even look at the images, um, 
we can find some independent information that actually tells us the population in the area and we can verify it from several different sources to see that the numbers being claimed here would imply that 50% of the people in that area are suffering with diabetes. So that's serious. You've got people whose health might be declining, invisible and unrecognised by the medical services. And going back to the map, well, that elevation doesn't really tell you much. The colour and the elevation are actually showing the same thing. So we can flatten it out for a start. And the colours are a little bit misleading. So turning it into grayscale allows us to see a bit more of the structure in the data. And anyone that uses contour maps can see there are features here. There are some peaks and some pits going on. And a little bit of digging allows us to see, you can probably see these little red stars here, each one of those is a GP surgery. It's the location of a GP surgery, and at that location there's a count of registered diabetes patients. So I think a lot of you can already see what is wrong with this map, probably ahead of me, but I'm going to continue anyway. The next thing is, what are the units? So that smooth surface... Uh, didn't tell me anything about what it was patients per square hectare, per square kilometre, patients per hectare. In fact, that smooth surface was just a cartographic cosmetic representation. And there are clues in these craggy looking squares around the edges that this is actually pixelated. We've got pixels or cells across the area, and in every single one, there's an estimated number of people. So I can just about believe that in this area here, there are 262 sufferers of diabetes. But Cannon Hill Park has also apparently got 244. <laughs> so where are they all hiding? <laughs> They're in the bushes, I think. So these values have been estimated in some way, and maybe not a very good way. Again, the text tells us that it was done with interpolation, but that's a rubbish sentence. The second half of that sentence just tells us the same as the first. It's just a definition of how interpolation works. I don't want to know how it was done. I want to know why. What assumption made it OK to fill in the gaps between the surgeries in this way? So if it was rainfall, we would measure the rainfall at several different locations, and we'd be trying to guess it at another location where we didn't know anything. We use the information we do have at those two locations to build a model of what's going on, the process which is all, all over the area, and then we project that model down to come up with an estimate. Uh, but it's not going to be an accurate estimate. There are a variety of values we could get because there were so many assumptions going on here. So that's my other question about that map and that figure. Where's the uncertainty? There's no upper or lower range being presented. I'm just being given a single number of patients. And of course, pa people don't behave like rain as it falls from the sky. People flow across the landscape, but they flow in lumps, people-shaped lumps. And they flow uphill sometimes. And one of the places that they might flow to is a doctor's surgery. So when they do flow to that surgery, if you count them there as if they lived there, which is the problem, it doesn't then make any sense to make up a whole, whole lot of other people to fill in the gaps that have been left behind. So this has done a lot of overestimation. And the worst thing about this map is that it's a serious problem. There are actually these... Uh, ignored people uh, who aren't actually being diagnosed and found and we do need to locate them but this isn't the way to do it. So I wouldn't get a map like that and a figure like that through a scientific peer review, I hope. But what I might do is publish it online and get a whole load of concerned spirit, um, citizens behind me, say, you know, backing my case and uh, backing up my map. And if we could find a really uncritical journalist, we might be able to get them to represent me as some kind of battling boffin who has discovered single-handedly a terrible cover-up. Or, alternatively, at any point in that stupid process, you can stop me from doing this. You can demand that I expose my data on my model so it can be verified against real data in the way we just did. You can demand that I use the data in the correct way. And you can actually also ask that I give some kind of a range of uh, the ideas of the uncertainty on this estimation. And you've got weapons against me uh, if you want to, to battle against me. Um, there are, for example, fantastic authors. We've got current books and classic books telling us really interesting and engaging ways of reading through this kind of obfuscation, interpreting reports of risk, and also how to read maps, because maps can be alluring, they can be engaging and persuasive, but they can also be completely wrong. So given that humans are such blunderers, why don't we just automate everything? 
So here, for example, is a nice uh, model, uh, an interpolation model, which has a lovely web client. And it will do a better job for you because it will not only estimate the output uncertainty, but if you've actually got uncertain data to go into the model in the first place, it will also handle that. And it will do a few other clever things, like it will tell you if you have conflicting values at the same location and whether or not you actually have enough data in the first place to do this. But the drawback is that we might be blunderers, but computers are still idiots. So this model doesn't understand context. It can't tell me if I'm trying to interpolate the wrong sort of phenomenon, rainfall versus people. So maybe in the future, the semantic web will allow us to describe everything in such brilliant detail that I'll be administered with a mild electric shock when I try and do the wrong thing with this model for doing something mathematically inappropriate. But we're not there yet. And my other argument against automation, this is my dad, and he's definitely a scientist. So he likes to uh, have things neatly labelled. And because he's also a very frugal guy, he cuts his labels into small pieces. And that then, of course, makes it really difficult to get them off the backing. So he has to use a scalpel blade to find that tiny little gap between the label and the backing. And he tells me that every time he does this, he really enjoys it because he marvels at how that tiny change in pressure is being transmitted through his hand dirty fingers up his arm <laughs> to his brain and being matched against a search image that somehow he has constructed of what it would feel like when it felt just right. So you could automate that task. I've got colleagues who have a robot which will drill through the shell of an egg and it will stop when it hits the membrane and it won't even damage the membrane. So they've broken down the task and they've created an optimization goal and maybe they're giving that robot the same kind of buzz that my dad's getting when he gets this right. But that would seem a bit of a pity because computers, for example, can do recombination until the cows come home. But it's only for us that it's actually play. So I really love the citizen science projects that allow us to get out of doors and to explore things and to find things and engage with nature. But I'm also really impressed with the ones that allow us to combine algorithms and computing knowledge with, uh, to, to save us from falling into statistical and perceptual traps, but still allowing people to do the things that they're good at and they enjoy, things like language and context and pattern. So things like using your senses and your common sense to virtually fold a protein molecule, or deciphering the handwriting of a ship's captain on a ship's log to, uh, to help with historic weather collection. So recognising features on a historic map, which only we can do as well, uh, that well, to allow it to be warped into shape. Or distinguishing patterns of agriculture to help with a global land cover monitoring survey. So we don't need to be scared of democratic data. We need our wits about us. It would be unwise to underestimate the care that you need to take and sometimes the mathematical treatments that are necessary to use it properly but it would be really foolish to forget how much individuals can contribute by play, through experimentation and through their insights that build up these small, small, small steps that make up science, but that occasionally lead to really big breakthroughs. Thanks. <laughs>